time it. All right, good afternoon. If there were a price for the most contradictive title, I'm pretty sure this talk should have been should be nominated for that. Because you could wonder what is pragmatic about anything if you say with buzzword, buzzword, and buzzword using buzzword framework. Right? There's not much um, uh, pragmatic about that. Um, fortunately, our, uh, our, our vision with Axon Framework is to make the framework not about the framework. So as much as, as you write code, that the code you write is about what you want to achieve with your code rather than what you want the framework to do for you. It's up to you to decide whether we are there yet or not. And if not, please tell me what we can do to, uh, to improve. Now, you can imagine that a lot of um, uh, new, new technology, uh, the adoption of new technologies, goes something like, like this. You, you explore, you play around, you have your little toy project, and there's a point where you want to run that. So you've built some, some applications, some really awesome combination of framework tools, and you know, it buzzword compliance is checked here, right? It's, it, this is really everything, so it's got some uh, cloud, blockchain, you know, everything that's hip, you got that running, and you, you execute this, and it starts running, you know, it starts, starts up a JVM, and it starts collecting information from, from the internet about different ways to greet people, and it uses the camera feed and your browser from, from your browser to detect the kind of greeting you would want, and it goes like this, and you go, yes, I made it, right, I did it. And then you want to tell everybody, uh, especially I try to show this to my wife, like, look, cool. And she goes like, yay, hello world, okay. It's okay, honey, grab a beer and watch TV. Um, so the next thing you want to do is take this technology to production. Well, probably not quite. Production is not a place where you want a lot of excitement, right? Production is supposed to be a very boring place where nothing ever goes wrong. Because if something goes wrong, somebody gets a phone call. Or worse, some annoying sound or alarm going off, and then people have to start running and ex extinguish fires. So we want to make sure that whatever we do is either um, very stable is probably well used, and it's something that you do, need, do not need to maintain yourself, right? You want something that's decent. Unfortunately, in terms of architecture, and those who've, who've seen other talks uh, that I did in the past, there's, uh, I, I always take an opportunity to, uh, uh, to talk about this, uh, the layered architecture, and how much I love it. And a, a few weeks ago, I, somebody used this picture to, uh, to, to depict the layered architecture, and he called it the BBC architecture, the box box cylinder architecture. It has nothing to do with the Broadcasting Corporation. They're probably not really happy with this naming, but that's their problem. This is just box box cylinder. And the idea is that putting everything in a single box is not a good idea. So we put data in one box, some logic in another box, and then, sorry, we put data in the cylinder, some, um, some, some behavior in one box and some other behavior in another box, and we believe that's a really good idea. Unfortunately, a lot of these projects turn into what some would call the big ball of mud. And in my opinion, the big ball of mud is not made of mud, and I think this is a perfect example of such a big ball of mud. In fact, there's the architect still sitting on top of it. And damn, he's proud of his big ball of mud, because it's his big ball of mud. And that's okay if he maintains it till eternity, but unfortunately, even that architect will one day move to another big ball of mud and leave this one to I don't know who. So this has been a very dominant architectural style. Well, not only this one, the, the BBC, which led to, to this, but has been a very dominant architectural style for a very long time. And in many projects, I, see, I still see it being used because that's what we've always done. Right? Nowadays, we have the universal microservices architecture, right? because having one big ball of mud is not a good idea. So instead, we divide everything up in smaller boxes, with inside of them, very often, still the box-box cylinder kind of architecture. And there's a lot of dependencies between these boxes. Um, in reality, there's much more dependencies and much more of these small boxes, but I wanted to fit it on a slide. 
Now you can imagine that if you take developer principles or architectural principles that give you the, the big ball of mud, and you increase the number of deployable units, you just get a shitload of mud. That's the only thing I can really think of. The problem here is that we need to increase the modularity in the software that we build. If you take whatever uh, architectural style lets you do that, and you, you start adding modules, and I'm not talking about Java modules, that's uh, completely out. I'll, I'll leave that out of this presentation for your safety and mine. But if you increase the modularity, you get to some, well, nice, colorful picture, right? That's what I wanted to use there. There's, there's an obvious structure in there, unlike the big ball of mud down, uh, down in the bottom left. And as we are used to building more modular software that is more maintainable over a period of time, then we can increase the number of deployment units and basically have the same structure, but then deployed as separate units instead of deployed as a single one. Now, that's all very nice. You just think, well, let's pick the road up and then to the right, right? What's, how hard can it be? Unfortunately, the reality of the type of software, um, the, the type of environment that we're in, is there's a lot of evil anti-modularity forces out there. And they, are, they come in different shapes. Uh, usually, they wear suits and tell you that the deadline's tomorrow, and that you better fix this shit real fast. Um, but they come in other forms as well. Sometimes they wear jeans. Or, um, but there's, there's technical debt, right, that we are sometimes unaware of. They can lead to big bowls of mud again without us being um, knowledgeable about it. Sometimes we do see it, but we just don't have the time to fix it, right? And that's a dangerous one. But we have to acknowledge that there are some forces that drive us down, so we have to put in energy into our projects to make sure that we stay up there while moving to the right. What I think is a particularly bad idea is just to aim for the, bottom, uh, the top right right away from the start of a project. Because if you have an idea for, so this is the symbol of business case, some mechanics that make me money, right? That's. And if you envision that microservices is the way you want to address this problem and make that money, the road there is pretty dangerous. There's a death valley in between. It's a long road. You don't really know where to go. It's very hard to navigate. Anti-modularity forces out there are very strong. Uh, so strong they can even kill you, as you can see from that architect over there. And you'll probably digress into this big distributed ball of mud kind of uh, solution. Or solution, problem, I guess. So instead, a more pragmatic road towards microservices would be to say, well, start building a good monolith first. Some people out there say you're only good enough to build microservices if you're able to build a good, well-structured monolith. Right. And then from there, you can start to extract certain components, or maybe build new ones on the side, depending on whether your pro project is still, let's say, evolving, or whether you're more uh, deepening the functionality in the, in the project that you're working on. And as time evolves, you can extract more components, and maybe even in the future you could go serverless. But that's far away. Now, that would be a more pragmatic approach to, uh, uh, to microservices, but that requires a few things. And the most important ingredient that we see to be able to, to do this is what we call location transparency. And components are location transparent when they are completely unaware of their respective locations. So a component communicating with another component is unaware of whether that component is in the same JVM, the same application, or is it on a different JVM on the same machine? Is it on a different machine, different data center altogether? It might be on a different planet. Nobody cares. Right? It does not care. And that starts with proper API design, uh, but there's a lot more, uh, more to it. A very common way of achieving location transparency is through messaging. Is use explicit message objects to have components communicate with each other. Right? And then depending on how these components are deployed, you choose a messaging mechanism that works in the same JVM, 
aka method invocation, or you choose a mechanism like that uses a message broker, for example. Now, events are a very dominant kind of message in, in most architectures, and a lot of uh, uh, microservices use events to communicate, and in some cases, they only use events to communicate. Um, that's also a pretty dangerous. You know, using something for everything is, uh, is always dangerous. You should always rethink whether that's really helpful or not. So I've been going around different microservices projects for, for a couple of years, and I've found that there's basically not just one type of message that event uh, microservices will need to exchange. There's essentially three categories of messages, and they're, well, the events, of course, but there's also commands and queries. Right. Commands are expressions of an intent to change something in the system. Right? I want the system to do something for me because I need the side effects to occur from this command. An event is an indication that something happened. Right? We want to express to the other components in the system that I've done something and you might want to know and act on it, perhaps, if you feel like it. And they follow a typical pub-sub pattern, right? You publish it, and as a publisher, you do not care what happens uh, with that event afterwards. And the other one is the queries. You have a need for information. You need information that is not contained within the component itself. Some other component is responsible for maintaining that, so you want to query that. And a very uh, typical pattern is the point-to-point, -point, where you say, I have a query, some components can tell me the answer, give me the answer. But there's also uh, scatter-gather style queries where you say, I have a question, and I'll ask that question to everybody, and anyone who has an answer can shout that answer back. I'll take a little map reduce function and, uh, and take that answer. And there's another one, as we will see later on. But we, it is important to realize that event and message are not the same thing. An event is a type of message, but not every message is an event. So I've prepared a little demo application, and um, I'm not going to bore you with uh, long uh, sessions of live coding. So what I did is there's a Git repository, and it has all the commits ready. So I'm going to cheat my way through, just for your, uh, to make sure you don't get bored. So I've got an application, and it's about bike rental. Right? I do this presentation outside of the Netherlands quite often, and they have to get used to that. You know, the, for them, the Dutch are all about bikes. right? They, they see the Amsterdam Central Station, or even here at Utrecht, and then it's like, You've got, you guys have bikes everywhere. So there's a bike rental, and um, there's, a, uh, there's an application. It's a Spring Boot application, so there's always this empty class here that bootstraps the entire application. I've got my controller here that has a number of mappings. So there's uh, some request mappings on slash bikes. And as you can see here, it uses a command gateway and a query gateway. These are the APIs for, for messaging in, in Axon. Right? So if I want to send a command, I use a command gateway to just send a command, and it will magically arrive at some destination that can handle that for me. So what I can do is I can uh, register a bike. So when I invoke that request, it will send an object on that command gateway, and that command gets routed to a destination automatically. It's not that magic. It's uh, basically a for loop or if statement, if you will. Um, and um, the other one is a query gateway. So I can do find all bikes. I want to find all. There's no specific payload I want to send uh, as part of that query. And I want all instances of bikes that I can find. Right. So we can run this. And in the meantime, I'll show you the bike itself. So there's a bike. The bike is annotated with at entity from, uh, from JPA, at aggregate from, from Axon. And this tells Axon that this bike has some command handlers on it, so I can register a bike. So if that command arrives, because it's on a constructor, it will create a new bike. And it will store that 
whatever state is, um, um, is modified, it will store that into, in this case, a JPA repository. When I rent a bike, it will load the bike instance that the rent bike command identifies as the target. So I want to rent a bike, I pass in, come on, scroll right. There's a bike ID in there, and that is annotated with target aggregate identifier, so Axel knows, oh, that's the bike you want to modify, I'll load it and pass the message to that specific instance. Right, so I've got some HTTP requests ready here. Presentation mode is really nice, but it leaves you with the old school 80 by 25 kind of. So I can run this endpoint and it will tell me that there is no bikes, I hope. An empty array, that's fantastic. So I can register a bike. And for some reason, it's registered in Vilnius, great. And let me rent that bike. And now it's bike rented to me. So if I check the list of bikes again, I will see one bike in Vilnius that was rented by me, great. Now I can return that bike as well. Oh, that's a nice ride. Bike return in Barcelona, great, why not? an acceptable distance, I guess, and that's where Stephen picks it up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can interact with this. And these are really nice location transparent components, right? Three classes are considered components in this case, and they are completely unaware of where they were. But do we have a lot of value in here? You could wonder, right? They're still deployed in the same unit. It's good that we didn't have to really wire them, but still, it's a bit iffy. Um, the, the added value is limited. Now, who of you is familiar with CQRS? Well, I really should, I really should start asking who's not, because who's not? Okay, quick check, did everybody, who did not raise his hand? See, I knew it. You know, kind of, half-half, right? Or you didn't know whether you knew it or not. Um, so CQRS is, um, so it used to be like two hands going up, right? A few, few years ago, who knew about CQRS, two hands go up, and that's... Um, but the idea of CQRS is pretty simple, and this is the architectural diagram of it, right? There is a component, and it, it, it uses an application, and that application is divided into two parts. One part is responsible for executing commands, and the other part is responsible for executing the queries. Because executing, that's the idea of CQRS, executing commands is a completely different activity than executing queries. So these are concerns you want to separate. And in some applications, that makes perfect sense. And what this allows you to do is create different models that are optimized for doing that specific task. They're optimized for either executing commands, and you need certain data, and there's logic. Very, very often, there's complex business logic in that part. And you don't want that complex business logic to leak out to the other side. Or the simplicity of data be being served, you don't want that to leak into a complex model and make it even more complex than it already is. But it also allows us to address different non-functional concerns that we may have in our application. Uh, so one component might be very complex and deployed very often. Right? It's something that we need to update all the time, and maybe some other components are very simple and is hardly ever deployed. It's just there and it runs and it's being used by people. Um, some other components might have seasonal peaks, right? Christmas, shopping, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes there's uh, very unstable components that like to crash, right? And, uh, well, we could uh, spend tremendous time in finding out why that component crashes, or we'd say, well, let's, let's bulkhead that and deploy it separately. Right? Let's deploy that in its own JVM and let it crash, and we'll just start a new one when it does. Right? So these are all kinds of uh, non-functional concerns, and there's lots more that may um, tell you that it makes sense to separate these, uh, these out. Now, even in the very simple application that I had, I mean, what's complex about bike rental? 
Okay, let's not go in there. But even in a very simple application, I already had some accidental complexity. If we look at what, how the bike class itself is structured, it has three properties. The bike ID, the location, and the renter. But if we look at the kind of information we need when we want to rent a bike, we don't really need that, all that information. So this information is very useful for making queries, but it doesn't really help us to execute the commands. Basically, for a command, the only thing we want to know is, is this bike already rented out? If it is, we can't rent it out again. And if it's not, we can rent it out, right? We don't need to uh, know the location of the bike, at least in this application, because if you rent a bike, you're physically next to it. Right? So it doesn't really matter where, where you are with it. I mean, if you drive from Vilnius to Barcelona, you can't keep up where it is all the time anyway. So let's apply CQRS to that project. And unfortunately, you cannot do this. So this is how you apply CQRS to a project. It's fairly simple. Um, so we go back to, is this readable in the back? That was not a very enthusiastic yeah, so it doesn't really leave me with, a, with an answer here, but that's okay. I'll uh, just shout no if you don't. All right, so um, as you can see here, the, the modules have slightly changed, or the packages have slightly changed. There's a core API package, essentially the same as it was previously. There's a bit of Kotlin in here. I know there's some Kotlin fans out here, so I want to please everybody. Um, the thing I love about Kotlin is the fact that you can express your data classes as single lines, and they're just as readable or more readable than the multi-line uh, file-filling uh, classes in Java. Um, so we can express the type of messages that we want to send, in this case, commands and events. For queries, we didn't need explicit uh, message objects. Um, and we moved the bike to uh, the command package to really clarify that this is a bike class meant to use for commands only. Now, the only thing we care about is whether that bike is available or not. Where that bike is and who rented that bike is not information we need to execute any of the validation that we have on the methods here. So we still have our command handlers. Uh, when we register a bike, it becomes available. Uh, when we rent out a bike, we check whether it is available. If it is, then we set the availability to false. And apply is the way in Axon to emit an event. Right. We'll get to some of the details later on. And when a bike is returned, we set the availability flag to true again, and that's all we, we need to know. But of course, there's the queries. There's this information need that we have in our application, and we've moved that to a query package in here, and we called it bike status, just to not confuse it with the bike itself. This tells us about the status of a bike. So where is it and who's got it? So the bike status is a fairly simple object, some getters and setters, and it's probably an identity. Right? This is information we store. And then there's this projection class, and that's where the interesting, interesting stuff happens. So this uses a repository, in this case a Spring Data JPA uh, repository. Very complex, as you can see. And when a bike is registered, it just uh, stores a new bike status object. Right? And then as a bike is rented or returned, that status is updated accordingly. Now, you might think, oh, that's eventual consistency. That's going to bring me a lot of, well, give me a lot of trouble, and I have to think about everything. No, it's not. It's only eventually consistent if you want to. Right? Um, if you want to, this event could be handled here immediately. But that's only possible if it's running in the same JVM. So if you rely on strong consistency, you rely on everything in a single JVM, and that's not always a nice thing to rely on if you envision microservices. So we can run this application now again. Stop it. And this is the most boring demo ever, because nothing will effectively change. We can go back to our requests. So empty bikes. 
Let's issue that bike in Utrecht. Great. We rented it. I rented it. Fantastic. Now Stephen wants to rent it because he lives around here. And then we get this legal state exception. Right? It's not allowed because the bike is already rented out. Great. I will return it in. Ooh, not sure if that will work. Let's see what happens. Who cares? It's only a demo. Um, OK, it works. So uh, we return it in, uh, in The Hague. And that's where Steven can now pick it up. And that works, right? So the workflow still works. And we can check the status of this specific bike. And we can see now that Steven picked it up from The Hague. Nothing changed. This is exactly the behavior we had before. Except now we have commands and queries. We've changed our model a bit to be more focused on, on executing commands in this overly simplified application. So you might wonder what's pragmatic about that. But there's something special about these events. We're now emitting events from this, this bike, right? It's, it's emitting events that are then picked up by projection. And how can we guarantee that the event we are publishing and the, fact, the, the storage of the command model, how can we guarantee this is atomic? Right. That's a little well, challenge. There are solutions to that challenge. But there's another one. How can we guarantee that the events we publish are a full record of everything that happens? How can we make sure there's no gaps in it or that we are emitting things that we don't, didn't really that didn't really happen. Right? And the trick of that is to use a concept called event sourcing. Now, event sourcing is a mechanism then that instead of storing state, where in state storage you have an, um, a class that is mapped to a, well, typically a relational uh, data store, but it could be any uh, type of database, and you can see the properties. And every time you change a property, it overwrites the previous value. Now, with event sourcing, it's slightly different. Instead of storing the state, you store the changes that caused the state change to happen and that describe the state change. So we can see an order was created. An item was added. Oh, two items were added. That's interesting. And then an item was removed. Then the order was confirmed. It was shipped and then canceled. So. What we have here is a little history that tells us a lot more than the state over there. Right? We can now see that somebody added two chairs to his order, but then removed one before confirming it, and then canceled the last one after confirming it and after it was shipped. And that's why we had to wait for the return shipment to be received. Now, there might be some, uh, some analytics you can do here. I'm not sure if there's people in the retail uh, out here. Uh, this is my idea, right? If you use this, you know. Um, the, um, there might be some patterns in here, right? Somebody is not really sure if he wants that chair. Probably you can't take that uh, conclusion from just one um, stream. But using event sourcing is really about capturing the truth, and not only the truth, but the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In other words, everything that happened is in the stream, and everything that's in the stream is actually something that happened. That's a guarantee that in some cases you want or need or must have. If you're in an audit-heavy environment, if you're in finance, there's a big chance that there's applications. Well, not a big chance. It is a fact that there's applications out there that have heavy auditing requirements. Event sourcing and auditing, they go very well together. Right? One of our customers is a large uh, um, English bank. And they had an audit. And the, uh, the chief architect there, had, he said, well, that audit was a breeze. We just had the event log. Everything he wanted to see, everything he wanted to explain, we could just get the event log out and show that to him. So the value of event sourcing is in the fact that you have an audit trail. And it's not an audit trail as a side effect. It is in the core of your system. Right? The audit trail is used by your own application to derive the, uh, the state and then the, uh, the decisions from that. It could also be used for analytics, somewhat similar to, to auditing, except that it's not a mandatory thing. You just want to have the information yourself so you can get smarter about how you uh, execute your business. 
but it can also help improve modeling. In some cases, it's much easier to reason about things that happened and have happened than it is to reason about behavior and state. Right? Especially in complex domains, modeling it using event sourcing is a lot simpler. And there's a nice, uh, some nice fixtures that you can use for, for testing. Given some, behavior, some decisions in the past, when I execute this, I expect some other decisions to have been published. But the thing I like most about event sourcing is the fact that you capture everything and having everything stored, everything that happens stores, stored, gives you the, what I call the power of not now. Maybe you know the book, The Power of Now. Well, this is about not living in the now. This is like not caring. Like, well, I don't know. I, we'll see. Uh, I play that trick with one of my customers, and uh, it made him feel a bit awkward. Like, do you need, you need to prepare your data for some analytics that we want to do in the future? I said, oh, great. Um, but I don't care. Do you know what kind of analytics you want to run? Not quite, but you know, we, we need to make sure that we have all information. I said, well, yeah, sure, whatever. I don't care. But you tell me what kind of analytics you want, and then I will we'll do the analytics. Until then, I don't want to hear about it, I don't want to care about it. It's just a distraction. And I, I just played a nasty game with him, and he got it after all. But. So let's, uh, let's see how that event sourcing thing works. So very similar to applying CQRS, uh, it's just different identifiers you need to use. And then wait for the IDE to refresh. That's basically the trick. So the big thing that changed is in the way we structure the bike class, because that is the, the only place where event sourcing really has, a, has an impact. So instead of storing state directly in our command handlers, we now only make decisions in our command handlers. So the register bike is not particularly interesting. We always allow the registration of a bike, as long as the identifier is unique. But if we want to handle a rent bike command, we want to make sure that the bike is available. Well, if it's not, we throw an exception. If it is, we just apply the event. So this is basically just saying, when we rent out a bike and it's available, then we decide that the bike was rented out. Fantastic, that's all. Except that when the same command comes in again, we want to make sure that the is available flag flipped. But we can't do that in memory by just changing the available flag. We need to make sure that it is done based on the event. Because when we load an existing bike into memory from the past event stream, we only have these events. So we need to reapply those those are applied in memory automatically by, uh, by Axon. And there are some event sourcing handlers right there. So it says when a bike is rented, the available flag is set to false. When a bike is returned, the available flag is set to true. We don't want to do any validation here. This is stuff that happened in the past. We can dislike it, but we cannot ignore it. Right. We can't be a little children just going, na 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 na. Right. It doesn't work. The things have happened. And if, you, if they happen by mistake, too bad. Somebody ran off with your bike. Go fix it. Ignoring it is not the solution. In the command handlers, on the other hand, you still have the option to reject a command. Right? Somebody has the intent to trigger a side effect. If that is an illegal side effect, given the current state of the system, feel free to tell that component that it's an illegal operation. Now I can run this application, or let's, let's do it, because I need some of the data. Where is the application? So unlike the previous examples that ran completely using an in-memory database, this one is now running against uh, Axon Server. I'll show you a bit of that later on. But um, Axon Server is a database focused on, uh, on event sourcing. So it's an event store, and I'll show you in a second. So now we can execute some of those requests. So we can go to the bikes to make sure that we are empty. Right, we are, and we, okay, we issue the bike in Vilnius. 
I can rent the bike. The bike was rented out to me. I can rent it again. Oh, that's not allowed because I already have it. Steven can't rent it either. I can return it to Barcelona. Now let's see what the bike says now. And we still have the information, right? I returned it. It's in Barcelona. Nobody's using it at the moment. Um, you sure? Can I explain why is available is not state? Um, it is state, but it's only, let's say, ephemeral state, right? So the is available is, is available to us, nice choice of words, um, in, in memory, but it's not stored as a Boolean somewhere in a, in a database, right? It's not state stored. So the only way for us to know whether it's available or not is to do the calculation, quote unquote, based on the entire history. So if there was, were a balance of a bank account, we would go through all the bank statements and go plus this, minus that, plus this, minus, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, yes, that can be a painful operation if you have very long streams and there's very easy solutions to that. Um, like snapshotting and, and stuff like that. So it is state that is available, but is not stored as state. The events, those are the only state we, uh, we store. So, um, yeah, I've got a little uh, history. So there was a bike that was registered in Vilnius, rented by some guy who brought it to Barcelona, right? Now, this information is now stored in, uh, in Axon Server, which um, is information that is not lost when I shut this application down. Remember that as we move on. So applying event sourcing is mainly in the, the way we define our, our bike, right? our command model, because that is the place where event sourcing has an impact. On the other side, so on the, on the projections, we still receive those events. That's not event sourcing, that's just event processing. So event sourcing is not getting events from A to B, it's getting events from A back to A so that A can make new decisions based on the events that it appended in the past. Now having all these events allows us to, to perform replays. We have this information now, so the, the changes I just applied, the fact that I registered in, uh, the bike in Vilnius and I rode it to Barcelona, that is now forever available until I do a docker remove. Um, but there's an event handler, there's this projection that's keeping up with this status. And as events are added, it updates our projection, right? It updates that status object that we have. But this whole idea, this, this power of not now, is, uh, is when we think of a new projection that we can create. So there's a new projection that we can build and for example, the history. We want to know where has the bike been? How did the bike, for Christ's sake, end up all the way in Barcelona from Vilnius? Right? We want to know who, who did that. So what we can do is create a new projection and have it point at the beginning and it will just, I didn't want to finish the animation. Um, it will just go through the entire event stream, reprocessing everything that happened in the past. Right? Now you have options not to set it at the beginning. Um, some of our, our users have literally billions, if not trillions by now, of events. They don't want to just start from the beginning, so they'll go a certain time back. But still, you have the choice. So let's implement a new projection. Let's implement that, uh, that history. And I think by now you understand how that's done. So what we, or what I did, was I created a new package with some new classes in here. And there's a bike history class. And again, this is an entity. We just store this uh, in an in-memory database for simplicity's sake. And it basically has a, uh, the bike ID, some description of what happened to that bike, and a timestamp, when it happened. Now, that timestamp was not originally part of the messages or the events that I emitted. Right? And that's something Axon does for you. It remembers when something happened. And you can attach much more context if you want to. And then we have this projection that listens to the bike registered, takes the timestamp from the event, and just stores a new bike history element every time. So this is sort of an audit trail, right? This is a fairly straightforward translation of all the events that occurred 
to to entries in our uh, in our database. And then um, I um, added some extra endpoints here: get bike ID slash history, so we can see the entire history of of our bike. Now I can start this application, and this will cause this new projection to start streaming all the events from the beginning and make have this data available. So since there were already some events in that event store, it will just start it. Should be there already. Let's go to the request file. So let's take that history of that bike. Oh, there we go. And now we know who rode that bike all the way to Barcelona. So we can see all these history elements. We can see that the bike was registered in Vilnius, rented out to Allard, and then returned in Barcelona. Here's the proof that I did it. Um, and uh, now we can rent it out to Steven again. Great. And we can ask for the history again. And now we can see that it was rented out to Steven at 12.50.31. That leaves me 10 minutes for the talk. Thanks. So, the fact that we have all of the history allows us to do all sorts of analytics. And if we want, we can do some calculations on who rode the longest, right, the biggest distance on these bikes. We have the information for that as well. Pretty useless, but if it becomes a requirement, why not? We can, we can implement it when the requirement comes. We don't have to implement everything up front. Let's stop that application and move to the next one. So we have this, this application, and everything is pretty cool. Everything is like streaming, right? There's these events flowing all around. So essentially, when we execute a command, events are published, and these events are streamed to some projection that updates the database. And then we have that UI sort of polling. There's me doing a GET request every time. That's pretty boring, right? So why can't we just stream that all the way to the UI? Right? We have this nice event-driven backend. Front ends, they can stream as well. So why have that blockage in the, uh, in the middle? Now, there's different ways to stream data to the UI. And the very first implementation I did was pretty naive and stupid. And it was to say, well, there's an event. Just stream that event to the front end. And that seemed like a really good idea, but not for very long, because we found out that whatever logic we had to map that event to that change over there, we had to write that same logic in a browser-compatible language that shares just four characters with the language used on the back end. And we had to write everything again. Um, and that's OK if you know you write code once and then never, never touch it again. Who has ever written code that you know you will write and never touched again, and actually never touched again? No? Yeah, one. You build out, probably, right? Just deploy, run, new employer. So what we can do instead, we have this, um, we have this communication to the user interface already, right? We already have this bike idea, this JSON document, or JSON yeah, tree that we're sending. And that bike rented event will update that and put the renter in, right? So why not, when we do that, just stream that new object to the front end? It speaks the same language as the user interface is already speaking, just saying, hey, here's an update, right? That's one way. There's other, uh, other ways to do it. You can do a JSON diff. Say, well, on that document with ID 121324, change the renter to Steven, right? Those are possibilities as well, but this is, uh, this is somewhat simpler. So in Axon, there's a concept of subscription queries. And what, what we need to do for that is in the, I think it was in the bike history projection, yes, there's a query update emitter. Right? This is an object that allows us to emit updates to query models that we've done that subscribers might be listening to. And every time we change something, we say, well, we want to omit the fact that something happened. Whoever is interested in the location history will get this new entry. Right. So whoever is interested in the history of that specific bike that we just updated will get this new, uh, new entry. 
and the same for bike returned. Right. I'll not go into the syntax too detailed. If you have any questions, either, either find me or this, this code is also available online. So what we can do now in our uh, controller, there's a get mapping that produces a, uh, an event stream, right? a typical. Um, so what we do is we, have, we do a subscription query. We get a response, and we want to get the initial result, which is the list of, um, um, of, of bikes, uh, history elements. We flat map that, so we, we send them out as individual uh, entries. And then we concatenate with that with all the updates that we receive. Right. So we get our initial list, we stream those as in, uh, individual elements, and then we uh, stream the individual update elements that we get also to the front end. So I can start the application again in the new version. This is where I wish my JVM was faster. Here we go. Uh, bikes, here we go. Now we can watch this bike. And we can see it's still spinning. So there's still information. So that is our little event stream. We see some data coming in. That's the way, um, um, that's the uh, service sent events specification. And we can see it was rented out to Steven. So let's uh, invoke an endpoint again. Let's do return. Return in Utrecht. And we have our update right there. I can do this if you don't trust me. No, I can't. Yes, I can. Of course I can. All right. And then I rent it out, I rent it again. There we go. See? It's streaming to the to the front end. So this is just the information in the same structure as we receive we would receive any information from the front end. Now if you see the number of classes we had to write, or the, the amount of code we had to write for it, it's fairly limited and it's very declarative, very much saying what you expect we need to do. All right. No, that's not the one. The problem is we are still right there, right? In the whole pragmatic microservices journey, I've spent 50, 45 minutes not talking about uh, microservices. And that's the pragmatic part about it. Making microservices not about microservices, but about getting that structured non-big ball of mud thing. So we now have an application where Axon is sort of communicating between these components. But if we want to split a component out, we need to ensure that we can communicate. And Axon allows you to connect to all sorts of, well, you can use an event, shared event store if you want. If you think that's a good idea, that's, you can do that. You can use uh, Spring Cloud Discovery to have the nodes discover each other and make sure that they can send commands and queries to each other. You can use RabbitMQ to publish events, et cetera. Everything is possible, but that would take you a long time to connect everything. Um, Nowadays, there's also an open source version of Axon Server that you can use and, and put in the middle of that. That makes it all very uh, transparent and easy to use. Let me very quickly do that. Um, so what, we, what I did here, while I'm running out of time, is the bike application now runs with profiles. So I can decide to start multiple instances and then um, run uh, the, the, the bike command component as an instance, run the query component as an instance, run the history component as another one, maybe run four query instances if I want. And then that routing becomes automatic. I will show you that, but I will combine it with the next topic. Because as soon as we expand the number of microservices that we use, we have a little problem or a little challenge because there's a request coming into one component. That component sends a message to other components to do something. Um, then uh, some events are published and the query is published and it's, uh, things go all over the place. Right. 
and then something goes wrong somewhere, we need to be able to figure out why. What was the, the flow of events or messages? And for that, we have a solution, distributed tracing, which is very complex to implement because you have to make sure you attach headers to all sorts of messages. Then you have to start and stop spans and make sure that when you pass a message to the next service, that those spans are continued or a new span is created as a child, etc. It's very complex, so what we do and I will show you all the code that is involved in this. The only code change here is in the POM. We add two dependencies. You just say, oh, I want to use tracing. In this case, it's uh, uh, Jaeger tracing with, uh, with open tracing. Um, and now we can start this. I'll start all three components at once. Is it doing something? Of course, it's compiling. There we go. This is usually where one JVM just blows up for no reason. Let's see. So this is the UI. All right. So. I have an endpoint that just generates a number of bikes. In this case, one invocation will generate 20 bikes and rent that bike out 10 times, just randomly. Let's see what happens. I guess that's OK. And we have our traces. And now we can see we've got a trace. So here's our, uh, oh wow, 1,261 spans. Maybe I overdid it a bit. Uh, oh, that's an interesting one. As you can see, that's because we generate 20 bikes and then some of them are simultaneous, some of them are not. It's not highly multi-threaded, I guess. So um, there's a lot of uh, things happening. But what you can see here that somebody invoked the generate data endpoint. Then we send a command message that was picked up by some other instance. That's another color, which executed or was executed by the, uh, sorry, which emitted an event that was picked up by that query component to, uh, to update the, uh, um, the projection. So this allows us to trace where every command has been, uh, has been going. So for the sake of time, this is where I have to leave it. If you want to try it yourself, the source code is available on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, in the bike rental demo, there's um, um, Axon Framework itself is on GitHub as well, as well as Axon uh, Server. Uh, you can download Axon. The easy download is on axonlink.io slash download. Uh, and if you really want to learn more, uh, we're also organizing a conference on September 27th uh, with a lot more information. That's it. If you have any questions, um, I'm, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Thank you.